Hi, everybody. Thanks for, uh, if you're tuning in, thank you for joining us. Uh, want to apologize, we're just running a few minutes late, but you're here. And we're so excited about our interview today. So thank you again for joining us. I'm Carolina Quesada with the Nonprofit Partnership, welcoming you to this segment of Our Stories, Our Time. Now in this series, we interview nonprofit leaders to understand how organizations are navigating through the challenges of current times. It also allows us a glimpse into the issues and situations, situations facing local communities. Now, you know, it was about a year ago that we all fa faced with, uh, we were faced with dealing with this new reality of a pandemic impacted society and safer at home orders were evoked in LA County. And so we all had to, scramble and figure out not just how to keep ourselves safe, but also how do we keep our work going? In the months following the initial closures, we witnessed nonprofits make many changes to their programs, the delivery of services, and their staffing and volunteer structures, among other things. And by way of showcasing nonprofits and their stories, since we've been doing uh, since April of last year of 2020, we are recounting the experience of organizations and taking stock of what is happening, making an effort to capture these stories coming from all types of organizations and from the people who lead them. Now, before I introduce our guest today, the nonprofit partnership wishes to thank the Port of Long Beach for their generous support of our series. And again, if you're watching us live, welcome. Uh, please make sure you interact with us by leaving a question or a comment for our guest in the comment box. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you all and to welcome Dr. Wilma Franco, Executive Director of the Southeast Los Angeles Collaborative, also known as CELA. Welcome, Wilma, it's so good to have you here. Hi, Carolina, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and always a joy to, to get to see you and spend some time with you. <laughs> thank you, and I know earlier, right before we went live, we were talking about how you, know, you and I tend to like connect with each other every once in a while, just to kind of talk about what's going on in the community. So. Today feels like just like any other conversation, <laughs> quite honestly, with you. Yeah, what's and so going on in your life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the exception that we're, you know, have a lot of folks also listening in on the condo. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was also sharing with you that it's interesting because typically, you know, we're interviewing organizational leaders who are supporting one mission, one organization. Um, but the focus of the work you're doing in CELA is, is quite different. It's so interesting. And so when we had this opportunity to bring you uh, to our stories, our time, it was like, wow, great. We're going to talk about, you know, the work that a whole region, a whole community is doing together. So can't wait to hear more about it. Um, and there are a lot of folks out there who don't really know about Southeast Los Angeles uh, Collaborative. So tell us more about, about CELA and what you do. Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, I, I lead the Southeast LA Collaborative, right? So we're actually a network of organizations. So unlike, you know, you mentioned other organizations, right? I have the honor and pleasure of working with 12 different organizations. Uh, all of our members, they are what we call typically the nonprofit, right? You have a board of directors. Um, this for us really represents our 12 members represent our steering committee, right? And then so there is decision making authority that we all share as part of that. And, um, you know, my team um, represents the staff for the uh, Sela Collaborative, right? And then so our work, um, unlike other nonprofits, right? Um, one, we're fiscally sponsored. So that's, you know, something that's important to note, right? We don't, we do not have our own 501c3. Um, we are fiscally sponsored by Families and School, who's, uh, you know, one of our great members and, and partners that does a lot of work in the Southeast around education and policy. Um, and then, you know, part of our work, right, is really uplifting the region. And then so when we talk about the Southeast region, we talk about eight cities and two unincorporated area. The majority of those cities are within Supervisor Hilda Solis' uh, district, District 1, um, and then Linwood and Florence and Fireson are part of uh, Supervisor Oriel District 2 with Supervisor Holly Mitchell. And then so there is this, you know, kind of larger kind of area that we cover. And, you know, you know, funny, I, I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this conversation, right? And it's actually um, 10 years ago, um, wow. as of 2020, 20 years ago, that the initiative um, of the collaborative and the idea of the collaborative began. And this was, you know, way before my time, right? And, and I've been with the organization since uh, the summer of 2018, so almost three years now, um, but really kind of leading the efforts, right? And our focus um, is 
is multidimensional. One, you know, is, is the region, right? How do we make sure that this cities, right? So we're talking about, you know, a community that is 94% Latino, um, very, you know, uh, high immigrant population, right? But also, you know, is that little section between like the 710 and the 110 um, in Alameda, right? And then you have the 105 and the 10, right? And then so it's cities like Southgate, Huntington Park, Karahe, Maywood, very small cities, right? Um, but that have historically been under-resourced and have not received the fair share of their attention, nor have we really done justice to just the importance that the Southeast plays, not only for LA County's econo economy, but um, the state of California as a whole because of our connection and just our proximity to the 710, right? And, yes. the, and then so um, our work really emphasizes, one, the region, right? Um, really working on that regional aspect, but um, you know, two areas, one civic engagement, right? Um, how do we get our community involved? How do we educate our community, make sure that they are at the center of these decisions, right? And that when it comes to representation, that it's always community, uh, it, what's best for the community, right? And the other part is, understanding that nonprofits are critical um, to the success of mm -hmm. this region, right? Mm -hmm. And then so early on, I think some of the notions were, you know, Stella was kind of coined as a desert of nonprofits, right? And it's part of the reason why we, you know, also lead from a space of data and research, right? Because, um, you know, we are, you know, I always laugh because I always tell people like, I'm a data nerd, like I love looking at data, mm -hmm. but data is just numbers, you know, without the stories, without the qualitative um, data, we can't really paint the right picture, right? And then so um, our work is really, how do we strengthen the nonprofit sector, which is why we're made up of 12 mm -hmm. other organizations, right? Um, to continue to serve the community. Um, we're not service providers, but our partners are, right? And then so really leveraging their expertise and you know, there's a range of expertise as part of the collaborative. And that's really kind of um, the work that we lead in the Southeast. Absolutely. And, and, you know, just, and again, thanks for, you know, kind of trying to illustrate or paint a picture of, you know, the 710 freeway here, <laughs> because, you know, just so that folks understand the geography of it, the area that you're speaking of is traditionally known as, I think, the gateway cities right, uh, right. of in LA County, right? And that's important because, you know, we have this whole port, massive port community in Southern California. And so the gateway cities have a very particular history. And I think to your point and, and a lot of the work that Sela is doing and really trying to elevate is that there are a lot of issues that are going on, you know, just the proximity um, to a lot of centers of industry as well, to a lot of really important pathways for, you know, traffic and commerce and uh, the needs that have really come up in the community. So, so definitely Sela, the Sela Collaborative, you've been doing a lot of work around, like you said, collecting data, having convenings um, and, and tell us a little bit more about where you are right now with the work you've, you've collected, you know, where, where, yeah. how are you mobilizing, not just the organizations that are service providers, but um, gosh, there's a whole community of nonprofits, as you were saying. Yes. yes, definitely. So I think one of the newest report, right. And I, you know, um, want to kind of mention this, right, is, is we just released at the beginning of March, um, we did a public release of what we call the Sela Agenda. And then so this is actually an agenda that uh, we're all very excited about. I think that's part of the reason why we continue to elevate it, right, and there's a whole project behind how we will, you know, continue to elevate the agenda, right. And, and part of that is because um, it was really done in partnership with what we call the Sela Leaders Network, not mm -hmm. just our members, right, mm -hmm. but for the last two and a half years, we've spent a lot of time on building relationships, right, and the collaborative, you know, we do have a case study that um, really kind of looks at our history, how do we evolve, and it has always been based on relationships, right, and then so um, really kind of um, continuing to grow that area, understanding that you know, one of the reports, the early reports around nonprofit capacity was uh, well, uh, nonprofit needs assessment. And then so um, what we wanted to understand was, well, how many nonprofits are actually servicing Sela, right? And then so what we found 
was, um, you know, over 400 um, nonprofits. But mm -hmm. once you remove those that are no longer in service, it came down, you know, like we kind of began losing folks, right? Then when you really kind of focus on what, you know, different, you know, um, stakeholders and, and elected officials, as well as, you know, the philanthropic community were saying was the service providers, right? And then so when you look at service providers in Sala, we only have about um, a 70, a little over 70 organizations sell, sell, serving the Southeast region, which is, you know, the eight cities to incorporate areas, right? And so as we began to do our work, right, um, one of the things that we wanted to build was to build on the expertise and the leadership that already exists in Sela, right? And that was a lot of what we mm -hmm. um, heard over time is oftentimes, you know, people want to move into this region uh, from the outside without recognizing the importance of the leadership that has been playing a role in that region, right? So it's um, important to acknowledge that, right? And I think through building those relationships, through launching the Sela Leaders Network, we've been able to really kind of expand our work, but also begin to learn from each other, right? Like mm -hmm. there's so much value that we all bring to the table. Uh, you know, part of the leaders is, you know, anywhere from nonprofit leaders, agencies, like, you know, um, Nancy Peffers there from the COG that represents the Gateway COG. Um, you know, we have uh, nonprofit leaders like First Five and some of our members, but we also have uh, community organizers, community leaders that um, want to be part of this group, right, and should be part of this group because they themselves are also leaders. So really kind of pushing that envelope on what leadership means, right? Because we can all be leaders. We do not necessarily need to be nonprofit leaders to be considered leaders, uh, but really building that uh, momentum, right? And uh, that what, you know, what it led to was this creation of this agenda that calls for um, not only the COVID recovery, but the economic um, sustainability of this region moving mm -hmm. forward. And then, so mm -hmm. what we've done collectively, you know, with over, you know, 80 leaders <laughs> representing over 55 organizations um, was essentially put together a report that identifies eight uh, policy areas from education to nonprofit capacity building to regional advocacy, um, you know, and, and to health, right? And really looked at, well, what are the investment needs that are going to be necessary, mm -hmm. not just to address COVID, right, but to actually move the needle on this region, right, because, you know, this region, you know, I think this is something that oftentimes frustrates me because I, I you know, I join all these meetings oftentimes and, yeah. you know, whether it's, you know, environmental injustices, right, or, you know, air quality, water quality, access to child care, education, Sela continues to be that epicenter where mm -hmm. things are worse, right? And it shouldn't be this way. And then so, you know, I began to see this trend, right? Where it's like, every time I saw a map, the hot red, which is always like the worst part um, in LA County, always happens to land in Sela, right? And then, so I think this is the first time that we collectively call out, you know, not only just kind of like the historical injustices that our communities have experienced, but the need for us to work co collectively and, co yeah. and in partnership with each other, right. because this is the reason why, you know, a lot of social issues have not been addressed is because we, do, we try to resolve them on our own, right? And, and that's not possible. And, you know, and, and that's, um, that's a perfect point because uh, central to your model has always been networks and has always been a collective way to engage different partners and communities to bring different um, to bring different partners to the table. You know, to your point earlier, there are different leaders who've been doing this work for a long time. Organizations that are also have been working in certain areas and industries for a long time. So it's interesting because then you know here comes the pandemic. And the pandemic, I think, has taught all of us about the value of understanding um, networks and 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 knowing, you know, how to how to tap into networks if we are not part of networks that are that are wide or or maybe there are no networks in our immediate community. But time and time again, we've heard a lot of stories of how nonprofits are, you know, have again been looking for those collab for that collaboration for those partnerships. Um, and you've illustrated it beautifully. Even before the pandemic, you knew that this was going to be core to your model. So tell us about since the pandemic broke out, what ha what has been happening in, in Southeast Los uh -huh. Angeles and how have you come together? Well, you know, a, a lot, right? I think um, as 
I don't know if, you, if you're aware, but I'm sure you are, right? The LA Times coined the Southeast region as the epicenter of COVID in LA County, right? And then wow. so um, it has, you know, COVID has devastated our communities, right? We've, had, we've seen a lot of losses, um, unnecessary losses, right? Yeah. Um, and the reality is that we know that our communities are made up of essential workers, right? So our community are those that are not able to stay home um, the way that I have the privilege to work from my house, right, and educate my children here, um, a lot of our community did not have the opportunity to do that, right? Um, and then so, you know, one of the things that we did, we were right in the midst of the census, right, when COVID um, began, right, and just kind of closed everything down. So our entire strategy, which was this regional uh, census strategy, was you know, cost to shift, right? Like all of organizations. And, you know, I think this is where it's important to continue to elevate the role that nonprofits play as uh, the social safety net to community, right? They are the first responders. You know, our community is going to come first to the nonprofits that are servicing their areas, right? And then so, and that's exactly what we saw, you know, as COVID hit and we were literally like, I think we were um, a few days away from our press conference, our, our big press conference on the census to launch the the, the campaign, um, and we had to cancel that, right? And as we, you know, quickly shifted, right, to try to understand, okay, what is what are our partners, you know, having to kind of, you know, go through now, right? And then so what we heard was. Um, it, it, we needed to move forward this agenda, right, uh, around census, but it needed to be done with compassion because as we were reaching out, a lot of partners had said, well, community isn't going to answer the census form because now they're struggling with like paying rent. They just lost their job or someone's sick, right? So it became this very real, like, um, there's so much more that our community needed. Um, one of the challenges that we saw was, um, you know, access, right, as the CARES Act, the first, you know, wave mm -hmm. of resources came. Mm -hmm. um, our undocumented community was not able to uh, receive resources, right? We also saw, you know, we, we completed with the Pat Brown Institute, who's one of our members, um, the Living and Working in Sela survey, which then launched us to do a COVID survey, right? And through that, um, you know, community engagement, right, and understanding and asking community, what, what, it, what is it like for you? We realized that, you know, all these challenges were going to, to be that much worse for our community, right? You know, the digital divide, right? A lot of our communities yes. don't have access to internet, don't have access to computers. A lot of them mm -hmm. said, look, we've been given a computer by either a job or school, but it was like 6% of all the respondents only. Um, a lot of them had multifamily, right? I can tell you on that from my personal level, right? My sister lives with me, right? So trying to have three children on the internet caused us to like increase, you know, the the um, the power of that internet, right? To be able to be successful with that. Yeah. But our community doesn't have access to that. So we've seen a lot of, of just loss, a lot of suffering. Um, and the ones that have been, you know, at the forefront of trying to meet that need have been nonprofits, right? Getting very strategic in how we actually go about um, doing that. And then, so I think, you know, it's it's been a lot. It's been quite, you know, the couple of months and, and um, you know, it's part of the reason why we also knew, right, under the COVID testing, um, our communities were some of the last ones to receive COVID testing, right? And part of the reason why we lost so many folks as well. Um, and so we knew, right, uh, going into the cell agenda that the COVID vaccine was going to be critical for us because we needed to ensure that our communities were first because our communities are the ones that are losing their lives and, and that's not okay. And, you know, I mean, just all of what you're describing and, and just the tremendous amount of, of impact and, and, you know, I mean, when you've started collecting the data around, around the numbers and, and really started to put together a picture of, of what that impact was really looking like, you know, the devastation too, because there's also an economic piece tied to all of this. Uh, you're right. sick or, you know, you're a family member, something happens and, you know, there it also impacts the the income bottom line. I mean, just envisioning all of that, and you think about the level of mobilization and organization that has had to happen in Southeast LA, um, just to get the resources that are necessary. Tell us a little bit about exactly how did organizations, you know, come together, the role that CELA Collaborative played to really be a backbone to all of that coordination and all of that distribution and deployment. 
uh, give us more of a sense of what what that's been looking yeah. like. I think you know we've definitely seen how our partners have shifted, right? Like um, HSA, you know, who provides uh, meals on wheels to the senior community, was no longer able to provide hot meals, right? All of a sudden, it was cold meals. But part of the process, right, was also not only are they providing meals to the seniors that are homebound and and that may not have, you know, access to it, but they would also, through that process, do case management, right, and do a wellness check on seniors. Um, They weren't able to do that. They would do that every day during the week, right? So they went from that to basically moving, you know, frozen food to community members, right? That was a, that has a huge impact on, you know, when you really think about it, right? Like that's a mental health component for our senior citizens, right? So a lot of them have begun to mobilize, um, you know, reach out to each other. I think one of, you know, a beautiful example of, of something that was possible through this partnership, through this, you know, through the collaboratives work and our network was um, securing resources for our undocumented community. So um, through our work, right, we were able to secure um, a little over, I think now it's <laughs> closer to $3 million um, wow. in cash assistance for the undocumented community. Um, wow. you know, while we, you know, and I, I want to highlight this because I think sometimes people think we're larger than we are, but our staff, right, um, it's myself and two other colleagues, right, that are part of my team. Um, so it's just the three of us, right? Um, and then, so I think um, through that work, right, part of this process with this, uh, you know, with this resources was who was going to administer the resources and send the resources out, you know, and then so we were fortunate to be able to work and partner with um, Hub Cities, um, um, ABC Alliance for a Better Community, and East Yard and Sella to be able to, um, you know, our partners, um, you know, receive the funds, and then they then manage the um, outsourcing of the resources out. And that was, um, you know, I know for Hub Cities, it was $2,000 per family that um, needed wow. that support, yeah. um, support that had not been received. And I think, you know, Hub Cities has also played a critical role in the economic aspect as well, because, you know, not only were we having issues of like our, you know, undocumented community not receiving resources, but those that could qualify for unemployment, everything was online. Right. And this, I think, has been one of my biggest frustrations through this process has consistently been we continue to elevate the, the digital divide and how mm-hmm. that's impacting mm-hmm. access to resources. But our answers continue to be, oh, there's this resource, go online and submit right. an application. Right. And and I, you know, I think I'm a little extra sensitive to that because of my own um, family, right? And having my mom um, not know how to use a computer, right? That's that's something that I think hits home for me and saying like, when we talk about equity, um, that's also a lens that we need to bring to the table. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I'm sure that that was an approach that has even been informing the way all of you as organizational partners and particularly Sela because of the unique role you play and again, being the backbone for a lot of this collective work that's coming together, that equity lens is, is critical, right, to employ, even as you look at distribution or coordination of efforts or technical assistance and all of that. Um, so Wilma, a lot of what we like to focus on too when we have these conversations is um, in helping viewers understand, you know, what what is particularly, for example, impacting the community at this time. And I think you done a great job of really illustrating that. But you did talk about something that's that's really important, and that's the digital divide. Mm-hmm. And, and share with us a little bit more about um, how you're addressing that, how organizations are working collaboratively to try and, you know, bridge those gaps for for local communities what's what's yeah. going on in southeast yeah, LA? So, you know one of our partners right one of our members and seller leader um in the southeast is the southeast community development corporation sedc right with emma hernandez and and caesar there um and they have done work around the digital divide for over 30 years right so this is an area that's new for them but this is an example of those leaders that have been doing work in the community yeah. for many, many years, right? And then, so I know they have co- continued to provide, um, you know, resources, access to, um, you know, helping community like sign up for free internet and, um, you know, giving computers to community members, partnering, building, you know, working with LAUSD. I know they they uh, partner with LAUSD to issue out the computers for students, right? Um, and then you have partners like the YMCA, right? Where 
where because they have facility in Maywood, they have launched a uh, tutoring program, right? Because we know that some kids do not have access to computer nor childcare, mm-hmm. right? That's another piece. And as a single mom, I relate to that, right? Like not having mm-hmm. the support while you're trying to work and educate your child at the same time, right? And then so I know the YMCA also um, has launched a, a um, you know, distance learning program where students are uh, brought to campus and, you know, social distance, but they're allowed to use the internet there to do their homework and do their Zoom classes. So I think there's a lot of partners, um, you know, that are doing, just getting creative with how they um, use their resources and shift their resources, um, but also, you know, trying to figure out, okay, how do we now address this larger issue that it's not you know, it it existed before the pandemic. It just Mm -hmm. has been intensified by the pandemic. But moving forward, right, I think that's why, you know, you hear this cliche, right, we can't go back to what it used to be. It has to need to reimagine what what this would look like. And it's true because, uh, to be honest, it's like if we go back, we're still going back to the same issues that we've always had, that Stella has always Mm -hmm. struggled with. So thinking about the future, um, it's important for us to really, you know, move beyond just putting a bandaid on an issue and really look mm-hmm. at the systemic changes and, and necessary to actually address the root causes mm-hmm. of these issues. Um, you know, and I know some of our partners um, are, you know, doing a lot of work around the regional kind of access to broadband, um, of which, you know, we've been supportive and, and will continue to be at the table to ensure that you know, we elevate what community is saying and what we're hearing from community, because at the end of the day, you know, the the challenge of the lands and, you know, having those of us in in power in in these positions, right, uh, make decisions on behalf of the community without actually knowing what community really needs. And that is why it's critical for for us as a collaborative, right? Like, while we don't provide services directly to clients, we do engage community as partners, as experts in their own life and what's going to be important for their community as they move forward in their life. Yeah, absolutely. And and that, you know, what my next question was, uh, which I feel like you just answered it, but it, it, it was, uh, you know, what about, you know, the way that CELA is having these conversations right now, like the collaborative, all of the partners together, about how you really don't want to go back to the status quo, how we can't, it's not acceptable. How do we address the root causes of a lot of what, you know, keeps these inequitable systems in place? And I think, you know, you you certainly uh, talked about one of those um, and how unique, again, this collaboration and this work in your community is, is helping to really highlight through this example, the digital divide, right? And how that's not acceptable and what to do about that. Um, And so, you know, actively right now, schools, businesses, a lot of institutions are are really have, you know, attempted to reopen. Uh, Some are have reopened. In fact, Um, there's more and more talks of how do we reemerge again? You know, now that the vaccine, the vaccines are a little bit more uh, spread widely, more people are are vaccinated. and as we're starting to really see this movement really take up more and more steam in the coming months, what do you want to see for your community? What are your hopes as more organizations, more institutions are again, you know, reemerging, probably in some ways in a hybrid way, but but there's more reopening happening. Yeah. Um, you know, I think our biggest focus, right, is the cell agenda, right? Um, because the agenda actually addresses a lot of that. So I think one, and then the coming weeks, right, really reconvene with all of our seller leaders. One of the things that kind of really side, side rail, like the launch and then the reconvening of our leaders, right, was um, that on March 5th, we, we became the lead CBO on vaccine distribution in partnership with the governor's office and FEMA. And then so for the last, you know, two months, um, our work has really been, you know, mobile vaccine clinics and making sure that our community get their vaccine, right? And then so I think as we think about um, the future, right, I think what I want to see is it's definitely a, a lot more collaboration. I think what we need to see just in general, right, as humanity is more empathy, 
uh, more grace towards each other. Because I almost feel like at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all very gracious, like, hey, this is rough. I think as we're in this phase of like, oh man, it's been no, over a year. Um, I think we're seeing a little less grace from folks <laughs> in understanding that that it is still a lot to, to manage. There's a lot of us, you know, I know there's a cellar leader that lost you know, her, her parents and her step parents. And then so mm. there's a lot of grief, you know, and I think as mm -hmm. we think about the future, um, you know, also prioritizing mental health. This has had a massive impact on people's mental health, people's wellness. And when it comes to community wellness, that is the center of what the Sala Collaborative is calling for. Like what, if we want to see real change happen, it has to be in, in partnership with each other um, and, and really kind of move beyond, moving beyond just like the, the band-aid solutions, right? Really sitting down yeah. and having some tough conversations with ourselves around um, what are the systems in place that are actually allowing this and how do we change them? And that's my child screaming, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, you know, living in grace. Uh, but no, and that and that's a great point, um, Wilma, and I think that you have certainly helped us understand how the CELA Collaborative has really been trying to model that and all of the partners around the table, you know, how you you do have to come together, how there has to be a very particular and deliberate attention to addressing these issues. So I appreciate you bringing up the, the CELA agenda. And, and on the last few minutes left on our call, if you can believe it, we're pretty much at time. Um, what's coming down the pike? What's, what's next for CELA? What's coming down that you want to let folks know about? Yes, I think one of the campaigns that we have right now is really um, focusing on amplifying um, and really sharing with folks. And I think the one piece that I think as a collaborative we have focused on, um, you know, since we began is the marketing, right? I think there's so much beauty in Sela. There's so much things that we need to celebrate. Um, there's so many organizations doing such amazing work. And one of the projects as part of this, you know, amplifying the Sela agenda and, and that campaign is creating these videos for our partners um, that really speaks to what is it that they do? How are they servicing community? Because I think oftentimes, um, you know, the narrative that has been created about the Southeast has been created by others. Um, and it's time for our seller leaders to be the ones that are speaking about the beauty that is the Southeast, um, the work that we're all collectively leading and how we're all going to continue to um, advocate and ensure that the, that the Southeast is not at the end of the line um, anymore as we move forward. Thank you so much for all of the, the wisdom that you shared with us today. Um, helping us understand a little bit more the uniqueness of Southeast LA and also the special collaboration and partnerships that have driven really good and honestly very necessary work in a very collective way, right, in, in the region. So for those who have questions or want to get a hold of you, what's, what's the best way to do that? Yes, you can actually, um, well, one, you know, I'm going to do a shameless plug here, follow our social media. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> um, you can also visit our website, but uh, we do have a general email. It's Sela at selacollab.org, um, and that goes directly to our team, and we can um, definitely connect with you from there. Excellent. And that's Sela, S-E-L-A, at Sela Collab, C-O-L-L-A-B dot yes. O-R-G, right? Yes. Excellent. Well, Wilma, it's been such a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Look forward to having another chat with you again soon. And for all of you who are either watching live or will be watching in the future, please, please make sure to visit them and keep in touch with uh, Dr. Franco and her team. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Take care.